I would just like to begin by welcoming everybody to this uh, workshop. Uh, my name is Wei Yi Li. I will be the moderator. And uh, our first speaker is uh, Professor Robin Yates, Disability in the Laws of Early and Middle Period China. Okay. So let me uh, move in uh, right away because I've only got uh, 20 minutes. And um, uh, we do want to have some time for discussion. So I want to thank uh, Dr. Rom uh, for inviting me to participate in this uh, wonderful workshop, and also to uh, Professor May and Professor uh, Sturks, and uh, for all of you for uh, coming. So thank you very much indeed. And I will. My paper was uh, essentially uh, um, 25 pages. It was about. Uh, uh, a one hour lecture, if, but I'm going to reduce it to uh, uh, 20 minutes, I hope. And um, I am going to basically show uh, the slides of the main points, okay? So thank you very much indeed. So the first thing is I'm going to be looking only at legal texts that contain specialized legal vocabulary. And I'm not concerned with general attitudes towards disability, nor am I going to be talking about the terms that uh, describe various types of disability or infirmity or abnormality uh, in transmitted and historical and philosophical texts. Those my colleagues will be doing, and of course, Professor uh, Sturks has already introduced us to them. So what I'm going to look at then is specifically the legal texts, and especially the legal texts that have been excavated in recent years, and also uh, legal texts and administrative texts that have been looted from uh, tombs or sites in China, uh, taken to Hong Kong, and then brought back to China. Um, so the first one that I'm going to talk uh, about very briefly is uh, texts that were found in tomb number 11, Shui Hudi in Yunmeng County in Hubei province. In uh, the, the scribe's given name was Xi or Happy uh, in, uh, and he was buried about 217 before the common era. In other words, shortly after the founding of the Qin Empire in 221 BCE. And uh, one of the texts that were found in this tomb, and there were a number, and I will talk, uh, give examples from a couple of, the, of them, uh, was given the title Falu Darwin by the archaeologist, or uh, quest answers to questions on legal principles and statutes. And in that, one of the items that is mentioned, it reads as follows in the English, I don't give you the Chinese, Killing a child without authorization, tattoo the murderer and make him or her a wall builder or grain pounder. So that's the uh, heaviest male and female uh, hard labor uh, punishment. Should the child be newly born and have strange things on its body, as well as when it is not whole or buchen, it's the same graph that Professor Sturks was talking about this morning, and then to kill it, do not consider the person guilty of a crime. Now someone gives birth to a child and its body is whole and it has no string, strange things just because the person has too many children and does not want it to live and then not to raise it, but rather kill it. How does one sentence the person? One considers the person as killing it. So in this case, obviously what this is, is an uh, instruction from the state to officials. Now, in, uh, I will go back to the question of uh, what is whole in a few minutes. Now, in these other uh, texts that were found in the same man's tomb, there were things called the almanac texts or the urshu or day books. And uh, these are very, very complex, but uh, one of the texts uh, includes the following, uh, and it's uh, uh, predictions about what will happen to, to children born on particular days. And so uh, here is one. So on the Bingcheng day, offspring born were thought to have blemishes or tsu on their bodies, but they would be brave. 
those born on the Ding Mao day will not be correct, or Bu Zheng. If that is not so, they will have blemishes on the front. And here, one might suggest that uh, not correct, or Bu Zheng, may be the same as not whole, the Bu Chen, of the legal text that I just quoted above. And where, according to the expert Liolia Xian in China, the front probably refers to the genitals. Now, uh, what uh, this is an issue that I can't talk about, but much later on in Chinese history, especially in the Ming and particularly in the Qing dynasty in late imperial China, what was referred to as stone maidens uh, or shunyu, uh, women who could not have their um, uh, vagina penetrated, pro were a very, very important uh, uh, category in law, uh, but uh, this is not the case in early China as far as I can tell. So in the Almanac text on robbers, which is another text in, the, in this tomb, in two instances when robbers occur, robberies occur in the so-called yin year, which is the year of the tiger, and in the wu year, which is the, deer, the year of the deer, and now this has been changed in modern times and contemporary times to the year of the horse, the robber is said not to have a whole body, which is the same word used in the Qin legal text I just quoted. So my uh, initial thoughts about this are uh, the following. It is possible that parents chose to kill babies who were thought to possess unlucky fates. But to kill a baby merely because the parents already considered that they had too many children to raise was a serious crime. In other words, a crime of murder under the Qin dynasty. And uh, we note that uh, the, there is uh, parallels with the later practice of female infanticide, which unfortunately is still continuing uh, to this day. Uh, and the second thing is that in this document that I just read, the Qin state seems to have made no distinctions between the genders, nor did they mention any perceived anomalies in mental facilities, nor whether the child was blind or deaf or had some other perceived deficiency. So the, my question then remains is in short, the question is, did the Qin permit the killing of disabled children who were not whole or who bore strange things on their bodies? And did the Han continue to allow this practice? And these are questions which uh, remain unanswered at uh, the present and maybe new archeological discoveries will give us these answers. So what is the term that is particularly used in the legal texts, in the legal context that uh, could be translated or interpreted as, as infirm or disabled. And uh, the answer is the term long and p long, not uh, the graph p can also be uh, uh, read as bar or, or stop. Um, and uh, these are the ones which are particularly used in this early period. Uh, of course, there are going to be many, many other terms which will be discussed by my colleagues in the work. Uh, for various types of what we would consider nowadays disabilities or infirmities, but they were apparently, they were not recognized in the law. So the only terms that are being recognized in law are the long or the pilong. So turning to another uh, text that was found in this same tomb, uh, it would be tomb number 11, Mr. Habit's tomb. Well, there were two items quoted from the so-called statutes of enrollment. And this is the statutes of registration of the population, a very important dimension of uh, uh, the state activity. And uh, it says here, uh, and I'm quoting, hiding stalwart youths as well as not registering the disabled carefully, the village chief and the elders are guilty of a crime punished by redeemable shaving. So that uh, in the tin might have been a, a fine of. Uh, 2,688 I'm not going to go into that. And then the second item says, when members of the hundred surnames do match being registered as being old, 
or when they have reached the time of being registered as old, for not using the facts and daring to act fraudulently and falsely, fine two sets of armor. When the village chief and elders do not denounce it, fine each one set of armor. Find the members of the group of five, one shield per household. In all cases, exile them or banish them. And so the statutes are uh, enrollment. And uh, uh, there are lots of things in there that uh, I can't uh, have time to talk about. But essentially, uh, the state is registering the population. Uh, they registered it uh, after a birth took place perhaps a couple of months afterwards, but they also kept registration of adulthood. And there's, when adulthood uh, took place, we don't know exactly as much discussion about that. But it would appear from these texts that the Qin state considered that there were two types of persons, stalwart youths, uh, Chinese, it's Aotong, and the disabled, or uh, Yilong. So now, what exactly is uh, the disabled? Uh, in another tomb, uh, which I have translated with my colleague, uh, Professor Anthony Barbi, very well, uh, are the early Han Dynasty Zhang Jia Shan laws, uh, which date probably from around 186 before the Common Era. And here it states very clearly, for a person who matches being enrolled for service, and has attained the proper age, but whose height is less than six chur and two tsun, so that's approximately 1.43 meters or 4.69 feet, as one as well as one who is congenitally deformed, in every case consider him to be disabled. And that's the definition in the legal terms. And then it also says, for the dim-sighted elderly, in other words, those who are semi-retired from service, in each case, half the amount of government service required for their rank and enter it into the account of the registers. Require them to serve only within the settlement, so only in the area in which they are living. For one who matches performing government service or garrison duty, but who has been sick for a full year, as well as for one who has been in detention and thus missed the levy, do not pursue him and force him to serve. So these are documents in these uh, official uh, legal uh, texts from Tomb uh, Zhang Jia Shan number 247, um, dating from about 186 before the Common Era. Another one is uh, this, and you can read it on the screen if you're able to. Uh, and it essentially uh, lists the types of individuals who can or cannot serve. And here I want to point out about uh, two, four, five lines down. For one who has a wound caused by a metal weapon or who suffers from a serious chronic illness, in every case, consider him as disabled, and he may be made to serve like those classified as dim-sighted elderly. For one who has injuries, but not as a result of following the army into battle, he is to work for the government for a one month tour of periodic service every four months. When he cannot serve, do not make him serve. In every case, physically inspect him for fitness in the presence the county magistrate or county commander. So in other words, that there was a process of determining uh, what kind of uh, disability the individual had. So here I will um, sort of make a preliminary conclusion and say that the state categorized those who had suffered from an injury, uh, for, uh, suffered an injury from a weapon while fighting for the state as disabled in the same way as if they were under height at the time of enrollment or were congenitally deformed. And so according to the newly published Qin County of Qianling archives, the, the Lie archives, this is another find, it probably also established hospices or hospitals for wounded veterans. 
And it also indicates that the Chin County had an official county doctor. And I should also mention that they had uh, in this um, archive, uh, there are also fragments of a medical text, a prescription text. So maybe the doctor used these prescriptions to treat uh, those who were disconsidered disabled in this hospital, but we don't know that yet. Uh, but uh, we can also say that those who had been similarly, similarly injured, but were not war veterans, they were also considered disabled. Uh, but the latter, so those who are not war veterans, uh, were still obliged to perform some kind of labor service for the state. So preliminary, I conclude that if there was a military emergency, the old, the disabled, and the sick or perhaps sick with a disability, could be required to perform guard duty. But this was only under extraordinary circumstances. And the Chin state also exempted individuals from service who were caring for an elderly parent or for, who, one, for one who was disabled. So in other words, caregivers. And this came to be a feature of Han and later law and has been associated with the so-called Confucianization of the law. But it is clear in my view, as in so many other ways, the Qin who were uh, criticized and hated and uh, debased by the subsequent Han apologists and propagandists for following the so-called legalism of Lord Zhang, that is Shang Jun in the state of Qin, they actually instituted policies that preceded and mirrored those of the Confucian Han and later dynasties. So indeed, what happened was that the Han copied the Qin, but pretended that they were not doing so. So now, before we turn briefly to discuss the references to Pilong and disabilities in the laws and administrative documents of the Han and later dynasties, it's worth noting that the Qin and early Han authorities frequently resorted to inflicting mutilating punishments on criminals convicted of serious offenses. In no instance were there any of those so mutilated, including those who were tattooed, had their noses cut off, etc., uh, were considered as disabled. Furthermore, no slaves, either publicly or privately owned, were categorized as, as disabled either. And so we need to think about that. So now very briefly to Pilong in later times. So the Pilong, uh, they kept the Han, Western Han authorities kept detailed registration. And again, they continued to consider whether in an individual who is disabled could perform kind of, some kind of service or could, who could not. And in the Eastern Han dynasty, the official terminology identifying the disabled changed. And uh, the term then turned to, to, from Pilong, Pilong disappears and Dulong or Duji appears. And there are numerous occasions uh, when the emperor issued special rations, etc., to support the old and disabled and the very poor. In the post Han period, you have uh, a development of uh, the notions of disability. And I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to be able to go on and uh, talk about those in much detail. But uh, what we find is that uh, in the Tang Dynasty, the earliest extant code in China, you have a much more sophisticated and, and elaborate system of categorizing in the law different types of disability. And so this is the introduction to the translation of the entire code by the late Professor Wallace Johnson. And uh, here you can see that they divided the uh, disabled into three different types with increasing uh, 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 disabilities, if you like. And uh, so uh, those uh, are uh, become very, very influential in later times. And uh, again, but still, let's say they, but still, they are uh, uh, accommodating or integrating or categorizing the disabled 
with the aged or the very young. So in here, uh, very briefly, I've not considered the treatment of those who are considered mentally incompetent or mad, Kwong, and there is no mention of such individuals uh, who uh, were, had some problems mentally in the early laws. But I've demonstrated that in the Qin and early Han law, the disabled were defined as those who are not legally adult by virtue of their stunted growth or by the fact that they'd suffered wounds inflicted by metal weapons, either in warfare or in non-military confrontation. And they were also treated like the youth and the aged, and many of the ways that the youth and the aged were treated in law were also applied to the disabled. They received milder treatment than was meted out to non-disabled adults, and the principal legal term used to or refer to them was lung or pilo. And single caregivers of the aged were also exempted from labor services. So in the later Han, pilong disappeared and the disabled were referred to as dulong. And by the Tang, further and finer distinctions in law were made as to the type of disability from which an individual suffered. These distinctions were carried over into Sung and Sisya or Tangut law. Uh, I don't have time to talk about that, I'm afraid, and even into Ming and Qing late imperial uh, law in late imperial times. And the legal treatment of the disabled has been quite extensively studied by experts in the Qing and modern and contemporary law. And I hope that indeed, as a result of this conference and in previous work that's been uh, published by uh, Professor Olivia Milburn and others, uh, that we will continue to explicate the long history of disability in the earlier Chinese legal tradition. So thank you very much.